Hey, everybody, this is Alex and Ben. Welcome back to another episode of the Oregon Bridge Podcast. Expanded states of consciousness and change in the way people relate to each other, finding ways to live more in alignment with our values, all that stuff is at the core of psychedelic medicine. And the more that we replicate Measure 110 and 109 with updates across the country, the sooner we'll get back from what is now the 52nd year of the former war on drugs. I think we'll enter a point where people are seriously interested and in wanting transparency on whether or not they have developed internal resourcing and done work to understand their own motivations. All right, everybody, we're back with another episode uh, of a topic of my choosing. So today we are excited to bring you Nathan Howard. Uh, who is an expert on psychedelics, a uh, longtime organ political operative, and has had a lot of experience with very influential ballot measures as well. Uh, he was heavily involved in ballot measure 109 as well as ballot measure uh, 110. He also serves on the Oregon Cannabis Association's board of directors and is the co-chair of its political action committee. Uh, and I was hoping we could have Nathan on today to talk about uh, measure 109, which essentially led Oregon to become the first state in the country to allow for legal psychedelic services to be used for uh, essentially for healthcare and for therapy, which I thought would make for a really uh, interesting episode. And Nate talks about uh, not only what sort of the, uh, what the, uh, what the drug is itself, what some of the different treatments are, but also some of the kind of political lens uh, of the subject as well. So Ben, what'd you think of the episode? Uh, I thought it was really fun talking to Nate. I've known him since college. I had no idea that he was going to be the guest when you reached out to um, to do this topic. So it was really fun to have him on. I think people will really enjoy hearing from him. He's funny, um, very conversational, and explains complicated things in a way that I think will be easy for folks to understand. Um, we, co we cover 109. Uh, we talk about the politics of 109. We, we talk about the logistics of it. How does this actually work? What does treatment actually look like? Where is it going to happen? Um, what are the controversies around this? So I think it's a this will be a good baseline episode for people who don't really understand psilocybin or are kind of new to the issue and want to understand it from the politics and policy space. Uh, so hopefully this is a useful episode for all of our listeners. Awesome. All right, everybody. Well, thanks again. Uh, definitely make sure to check us out and subscribe on YouTube as well. Uh, Nate does a walk around his room at one point. So you'll be able to, uh, to see <laughs> and, that. So. And his dog blue makes a couple of appearances. True. And the dog comes in. So, uh, well, thanks again, everybody. We'll see you in the episode. Oregon law imposes several ethical obligations on state and local public officials. State law also regulates and requires reporting by lobbyists. Rang Long PC's lawyers work with public officials and lobbyists who need advice on how to comply with government ethics rules. We also represent clients before the Oregon Government Ethics Commission when they are accused of violating those rules. Our deep experience with government ethics helps us evaluate issues efficiently and offer practical advice in what can often be contentious and politically charged circumstances. To learn more about Harang Long's government ethics practice, go to harang.com. That's H-A-R-R-A-N-G dot com. All right, everybody, well, welcome back to another episode. Uh, we are very excited to have Nate or Nathan or Nate Dog, as he also said before the podcast. <laughs> Howard, Nathan, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing good. It's Friday, it's sunny, and I'm hanging out with you two uh, public servants. That's the way I think about you two in this, this podcast that you all deliver in the in Oregon 360. So feeling groovy. I don't, I don't know if we want to uh, hype up Ben's ego like that, but uh, but thank, <laughs> thank you for the compliment. I was just going to say, what public service is Alex Titus doing just as this businessman <laughs> making tons of money? <laughs> literal hundreds of dollars. Actually, it's li liter literal tens of dollars from the, the podcast ads that we recently started. <laughs> yes, so. we just got our first check from Spotify, everyone. Um, and our ads are generating. I think the first one was like, seven dollars and 33 cents or something like that so nathan you should feel a little honored to to be part of this, this podcast right now you, you two could come to my neighborhood and buy half a milkshake with that <laughs> <laughs> he lives on hawthorne is part of the joke uh yeah, so all right alex get us back on track 
Yeah, so so Nathan, uh, so tell us a little bit about uh, uh, your background, and we'll go into into some specifics. But know that you serve on uh, a lot of boards, have been involved in uh, a lot of very, I would call them high level state profile ballot measures, but also frankly high profile national measures in terms of some of the attention that's coming in. Uh, give us a little bit about your background. Uh, how did you? Uh, what was kind of the interest in getting started in, in everything from the political side? Love that question. Um, and my answer seems to change every year or two. <clears throat> I think a seed of a lot of this is, um, you know, growing up in East Portland, you know, on Hawthorne in East Portland, not the kind of Portland they make TV shows about, unless it's a TV show about, uh, you know, at the time, 82nd being a major uh, human trafficking hotspot, uh, which they, you know, which I watched, I watched that in high school or in college rather. Um, growing up in that context, I didn't really understand like why a lot of my friends and family <clears throat> like made fun of the idea of going to college, right? And why uh, we didn't have sidewalks and why, you know, my uh, neighbor was inviting me to go over to, to, to make, you know, what I now realize was meth with him and his dad, like, and why type two diabetes was more common and why I was, why, you know, there was more obesity the kind of revelation of systems, you know, whether they're designed poorly or whether they're just over time not working well, like when a U.S. senator represents 20,000 people and then a couple of centuries later they represent 40 million and there's not a lot of modernization that creates all these weird problems. So I don't, I don't, you know, I don't pretend to think that these things are, are, uh, there's evil behind them always, but like that essential political awakening um, and realization that, you know, uh, for example, I eat fast food because that's what we subsidize and, and is more likely to make us fat and all that, that kind of cascading of awareness made me really angry, it made me angry. And I didn't realize how like angry it made me, but the chip on my shoulder and the frustration is what led me to think, okay, maybe, uh, William Carpenter's training center isn't for me. I was going to Franklin high school and the wood shop was essentially what kept me in, in school. And I was like, you know what, my former rebellion is going to say, this i'm going to college you know screw the haters i'm gonna you know and got denied from all public universities because my grades were horrible wrote a, a, a you know i think a, a comedic appeal letter to u of o u of o let me in and then the that kind of anger and awareness ebbed and flowed but it really pushed me towards a safer way to cause trouble uh it felt like where instead of going to the principal's office you get to change who's making the rules that we live by, and maybe you get a win bonus. So, so that one day you can have a very high stressful job that pays you know, $22,000 a year as a <laughs> <laughs> member of the legislature. At the time, I didn't realize how thankless public service was, but that was it. Wait, so uh, several things, but one, do you remember what was in the, the U of O letter that you sent? I've tried to find it. Um, apparently my, you know, early teenage record keeping was like, um, but I essentially wrote, I essentially wrote like, Hey, I never, never thought this was for me. Thought a lot of these classes were bogus. Didn't do the homework. Um, now I'm like, I want to do this. I want to, you know, I'd love you about to take a chance on me essentially. Hmm. Um, so, you know, that's where I met Ben and that's where I think we kind of had crossover Alex. And that's where I met a lot of people who are now serving in the Oregon Senate and the Oregon legislature and the governor's office and, you know, spending uh, stints of time in the White House. And the change of trajectory uh, is pretty, you know, a lot of people are having this, but it's like a lot of cycles were broken in both parts of my family, you know, intergenerational poverty and just cultural, cultural conditioning. And the big thing that I feel and has really brought me to um, expand, expanded states of consciousness and change in the way people relate to each other and, live, and finding ways to live more in alignment with our values all that stuff is at the core of psychedelic medicine. That is what really, at that time, pushed me into um, wanting to be part of positive change and essentially be like use privilege in a way that it feels responsible for people who didn't have the luck or the good chances or the able body that I had. So after about a decade or so in either electoral politics or elected office, uh, working on different campaigns, culminating with um, you know, wow, people are really upset with Charlie Hills. You know, it turns out uh, a mayor can't reverse uh, 40 years of, of trillions of dollars of federal divestment that created modern day homelessness. 
Uh, and they may, they get really upset with the mayor. Maybe Ted, you know, will be the most popular mayor in Portland's history. Let's let's work together, Ted. Let's make this let's make this mayoral campaign happen. It'll be really policy driven, and uh, we'll stop the 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 tide of triple digit rent increases and no cause evictions, and push for a, a statewide um, you know inclusionary zoning uh, uh, kind of like update and end uh, rent control and try to create more you know more housing. Blah blah blah. We did a lot of that stuff. Ted doesn't really get a whole lot of credit, but I think he's he's done a good job given the conditions. But in the office, you know, after we won the campaign, we won in the primary um, on a very policy rich campaign. Um, we then had a really long time because we didn't have the general to build the administration. That process was challenging, and then spending time in city hall, you know, in a in a state of affairs where we've kind of failed uh, to teach civics in high school, and so people don't know. Either what a state representative is, what the county commission is, you know, how to reach their their you know federal elected officials, but mayor is in everyone's lexicon, and it leads to this per and you know there's all these problems the federal government have created that we want the cities to solve or locals, you know, local governments to solve led to this wild pressure cooker, and I didn't realize that I was self destructing. I was becoming mm. insubordinate directly because I was disagreeing with some of the um, sometimes common sense and sometimes kind of soulless changes to the policies that we were that we were pushing that made them kind of ineffective they were in advance but i was also just feeling that pressure and i had become you know kind of a rarity like i wasn't cheating on my partner and i wasn't becoming an alcoholic i think that must <laughs> be the one percent you know working in city hall um, and i'm being kind of a naysayer and it's not everybody but it's just so challenging you know and corrosive systems corrode people so uh coming out of that uh, essentially self-destructing and uh, Maurice, our chief of staff at the time, who I think was annoyed uh, that his buddy Tim Kaine didn't become vice president and had, he had to continue to be the, the chief in a city that he seemed to have disdain for, he and I had a tough relationship. And I essentially uh, lost respect for him in the way that he went about that job, essentially being the deputy mayor, and sealed my fate um, and essentially gave him every reason to fire me. So once the you know front page of the Oregonian has, you know, Shown Nate Dog being fired for you know Grand Theft Auto or, or whatever nonsense. Was that front, was it front page of the Oregonian? Uh, you know, it was uh, at least online. You know, I, yeah. I, I never saw the print. I didn't read the comments. But long answer to your question, Alex. But like then, after all that noise, <clears throat> a single evening with a with a facilitator who just kind of holds space in a non directive manner helps you use the bathroom. After all of that is a relatively small dose of psilocybin, which humans have been consuming individually and ceremonial for at least millennia, broke me wide open uh, and made me realize uh, what was pretty clear. And that is I was, I was distorted and living outside of my values and becoming more kind of ends justify the means in my approach to politics and the stuff that I was advocating for felt more cynical. And I had been uh, coping with, with alcohol and other things that were unhelpful. And it was so powerful that I was like, I gotta, I gotta find a cell phone number for these two therapists that I heard through the political grapevine were trying to build the base of what eventually might become a ballot measure to bring psilocybin back into culture, back into a regulated model. Um, and you know, we had 30 years at that point of federally funded research showing that it was the most effective treatment on the market in comparison to what, what we could see for like treatment resistant PTSD and depression. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that we don't study for, like, what does it mean to find joy again? What does it mean to be at a crossroads in a career? What happens when your kids leave the household? Um, so I'm pretty much on a mission at this point uh, to try to increase that access, um, which has a, has a nice kind of secondary effect of the more that we replicate Measure 110 and 109, maybe both with, with updates across the country, the sooner we'll get back from what is now the 52nd year of the former war on drugs, which has largely propped up the carceral state while we have uh, millions of people behind bars right now, because uh, a lot of their charges are essentially trumped up by and, 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 and escalated by more risky use of these compounds, which is a byproduct of prohibition, the same way that we know that not doing sex, same sex, you know, or, or sex education creates more unplanned pregnancies and PTSD when you make these things prohibited and taboo, it leads to all sort of outcomes. So there's my monologue, I'll stop there. So, so, and, and no, that, that was quite, quite a lot to unpack there. So, so just to start, and that was actually, I was really excited to, to have you on the show, because from my understanding, Oregon is actually the first state, and uh, I'll get to this question later, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but 
the first state to actually legalize psychedelics that can be used in this way. But let's let's take it way back to start and just tell us what exactly uh, you know I've I've heard terms psychedelics, mushroom, fungi. Uh, what exactly is uh, is this, and then what is it not? If that makes sense, right? Like what are some of these, uh, like, what are psychedelics compared to, like, is that the same type of drugs that uh, people quote unquote trip on? Is that different? Like, uh, I, I have very little understanding of it, and I'm sure that our listeners do too. So could you kind of give us a high level overview just to, in terms of, I guess, the, the playing field, if that makes sense? Yeah, it's such a good question. And there's so many different uh, ways to talk about <clears throat> this cl class of plants, uh, fungus, molecules, we had different words for them. People call them drugs. People call the same thing medicine. A lot of what we're talking about here is uh, our relationship with these things, just like uh, food or uh, a liquid can be totally different given the context. So someone could consume, and humans have, unbeknownst to them or for recreational purposes only, something like a mushroom that produces psilocybin. Um, people can consume that recreationally, um, and it can be kind of a, a fun experience. It, it, we know that it, it, it creates more neural connectivity in your brain and then it makes some parts of your brain light up with um, connectivity. These are according to, C, to, to CT scans and research. And some areas go offline. There's my dog, Blue. Um, I think, you know, in the context of this purpose, let's just start with like one compound, one type of fungus and what it does to a, a person in the way that I'm interested in. So there's a lot uh, of evidence to show that the first basic life forms uh, on earth were fungus a lot. Uh, so essentially there are our ancestors um, and a lot eventually becomes fungus. Again, fungus does a whole bunch of different types of things. Some fungus, speci specifically a lot better uh, types of fungus, mushrooms that are um, native to the Willamette Valley and including Portland produce this compound, psilocybin or psilocin, and when a human consumes it, uh, what the research shows happens, uh, not always, but most of the time with large enough dose, is it interacts with receptors, a lot of the same receptors that um, SSRIs interact with, so antidepressants, and it's not long la that long lasting. It can be two hours, four hours, eight hours, and so it's working on these receptors in your brain, it's, it's bonding to these receptors and we're still trying to unpack why and it may be a century until we really understand why this happens. But, you know, if you think of your brain as just a bunch of meat, which it is, and thinking <laughs> and neural pathways is electricity, which is what it is, then you can just study which parts of this meat sack are being lit up by electricity and which are not. And then once you have that under, once you have that information from research, then we can then we can say okay well the, the front of the brain the you know the prefrontal cortex the neural cortex the newer part of, of brain in terms of uh, human evolution that's responsible for um, thinking a lot of thinking it's responsible for our ego what is our ego our ego is just a collection of stories that society and people have told us and we told ourselves uh, it's our personality it's why we do things it's why we get sad and find joy in things so the part of the front of your brain <clears throat> in the prefrontal cortex called the default mode network, which is where the ego and storytelling really lives. That part of your brain goes partially offline with large doses of psilocybin. And there's research showing mm -hmm. that other compounds and other plants and fungi, and sometimes not found in nature, but synthesized in the lab, do the same thing. <clears throat> so what happens when your default mode network you know, where, where our personality lives, where some people believe our soul lives, but where all of our, our behavior comes from, what happens when that partially goes offline, meaning our subconscious partially goes offline and other parts of your brain, which are responsible for all sorts of different th things, light up with more uh, electricity, with more connectivity. Your brain is just more active. Well, one thing that reliably happens, and this is what research shows, is when our subconscious is offline, partially offline, You're, we're able to see more clearly what makes us tick. The very kernels, the very origins of what, what drives our ambition, why we uh, talk down to some people, why we find joy through gardening, why we are committed to building a tool shed, whatever it is. It is both amazing 
And it can be really haunting if someone is out of alignment with their own values or if they're actively creating harm in a way that they didn't realize, either to themselves or someone else. Because our subconscious at a basic level is to protect us. It's to protect us from criticism. It's to protect us from uh, self-annihilation. It's hopefully to protect us once we understand social constructs from doing harm to other people. So when that thing goes offline, you're just able to see the root of your personality more and what makes you tick. And that's in that space and in the integration that comes after a psilocybin session, which are the, the, you know, will be coming soon to Oregon in the form of Oregon Department of Education regulated Oregon Health Authority licensed psilocybin providers. Once, once those online, you will see people coming out of these sessions and integration <clears throat> with what seem like kind of these magical um, epiphanies, but it really isn't magical. We're just giving people a glimpse into their own behavior that typically they can't see. And it's up to them what to do with that insight, whether so, or not they're stop consuming alcohol or not. So, so Nate, on let's talk about ballot measure 109 for a second. So now we've got a little bit of a sense of what we're talking about. What was the question put before voters in ballot measure 109? Like, what were we actually voting on? In ballot measure 109, we asked... Oregonians to uh, embrace a regulated delivery model of psilocybin to anyone who wants it, who wants a psilocybin experience, wants psilocybin service <clears throat> that's 21 ages or older. And um, this is to be figured out later down the line, like if they were. Um, Essentially, you know, we, we're not, it's not so regulated that we use the terms contraindication that's actually beyond our scope of practice and our licensure. If, is that word? I, I don't know what that means. Um, it, so essentially, if you are in relatively good health, someone, a facilitator, a licensed practitioner is willing to see you. They've made a determination that you're not like it's going to cause harm to you, which some people's psychedelics are not for them. Um, th then they can receive psilocybin. And it also stipulated all of this programming to deliver, you know, what humans have been doing for millennia, which is eat mushrooms responsibly. You know, how do we do it? And how do we and how do we structure this ballot measure in this program in such a way that it doesn't elicit a big cultural backlash, like what happened um, when Nixon started the scheduling spree of substances? You know, people were consuming these things that caused them to question authority fundamentally. And the guy, same dude who, who was the architect of the Watergate scandal uh, break-in was one of the main architects of the scheduling act, formerly the war on drugs. And he said, hey, people are getting you know, rowdy out there. Let's, let's tamp it down. It's really feeling a lot of anti-Vietnam War sentiment. So fundamentally, we said this allows people to consume mushrooms in a regulated access model you know, governed by the Oregon Health Authority. But then we included all these other provisions that we're finding out, in my opinion, don't actually make sense. But that was to get Oregonians comfortable with liberating, you know, the, these compounds, this this medicine again, because people are kind of freaked out. They're like, what? Mushrooms? Yeah. Think so? No, so, thank you. So um, when we, when many states legalized cannabis, they yeah. started with a, what the, what was referred to as medical marijuana. Um, yeah. And then eventually it became recreational. Does that Such framework apply to what we're talking about here? Such a good question. It is different in a real in a real way, um, in part because of the nature of you know marijuana, aka cannabis sativa, the Latin name. Like the active compounds in that is cannabinoids. Um, mushrooms, the active compound in mushrooms are uh, psilocin or psilocybin. Those thing, those two compounds interact with the human body in such a different way that you are going to find that most people are not interested in broad recreational use of psilocybin. It's mm -hmm. kind of like, do, do you want to do, do you want to go see a therapist for fun, you know, in your off night? <laughs> it's an imperfect comparison, but that how do, that's how it is for a lot of people. And with smaller dose, it really can just be very joyful and recreational in nature. But no, I mean, medical marijuana in a lot of ways, you know, that movement, medical cannabis, uh, Oregon being the first to decriminalize cannabis in the country, third to legalize, um, that was part of a 50 state strategy that's ongoing to end the war on drugs and all the punitive nature of it, driven by a group called New Approach. 
And they started in Colorado because it had more fertile political ground. Then they moved to Washington. Then they moved to Oregon. Now we work closely with them on replicating Measure 109 and 110, a version of that at least, across the country. So eventually we have a federal uh, approach with Medicare and Medicaid covering these medicines. So it was kind of different in, in the nature of like the intent behind why we made this. Tom and Cherie didn't start with a think tank in New York City, which is what led to Measure 110. It started with a couple of therapists who just wanted to bring psilocybin into a medical model. So maybe in like a century, 20, I don't know, 20 years, a century or 500 years, you will find that these things are really liberated. You can go to the corner store and find Iboga or psilocybin or THC or whatever it is. Um, but I don't think we're going to see that same that same model roll out this way. What I do think we'll see is people demanding that the underground, which is non-government sanctioned consumption of anything, um, but specifically entheogens, things that are non-toxic, have never shown to cause an overdose, are non-addictive in nature, and have the ability to create altered states of consciousness by their interaction with, with serotonin receptors. I think what we'll see is people demanding that that is protected and so as we create a regulated program that creates tax revenue, we don't use that as an excuse to ask law enforcement to crack down on the underground, which makes sense. People have been consuming these things for, for millennia and, and it's safe to do so. It's a little different than like fentanyl or trank, you know, like there we should have <laughs> a bit more regulation there. So before we talk about um, some of the practical usage here, um, where are we at in the sort of political and administrative rollout? Um, and how far away are we from people actually accessing? Um, yeah. So in 2020, 1.2 Oregonians said, yes, let's try this, you know, let's try this model out, regulated access to psilocybin through licensed providers at licensed service centers administered by the Oregon Health Authority. They said yes to that. Also included in the ballot measure was a provision that before anything went live, we would have a two-year rule development per period um, made up by a governor-appointed board of experts. And so we had a huge board. It was wildly productive and nauseating at times because you know sometimes you just need to do work and people just want to have an academic conversation about issues. Uh, that's, I feel like that plagues government boards across the board. And so you have that two-year period that finished really thoughtful rules overall. And then starting January 1, 2023, people could apply for licenses for um, facilitator licenses, service center licenses, which is where people will be consuming uh, regulated access to psilocybin in kind of a therapeutic uh, way. You know, some people might you know, want to come to Oregon for a bachelor party. You know what? You could do that too. You know, and I think those bros are going to be in for quite, you know, <laughs> quite an awakening. I mean, it's going to be bonding. There's probably going to be a lot of crying. Um, so you can, you can do that if you want. Um, but yeah, so Jan 1, all those license types, including the testing facilities and the manufacturers. So people who are going to take mushrooms and put them through a bunch of CO2 extraction equipment, like what we have for legal cannabis. So at the end, you just have the active ingredients in a tincture or in a in like a bomb or something. So that's all happening. And now we're starting to see all the license types awarded. So this ecosystem that we're creating from scratch, this trade is the, my preferred word as opposed to industry because industry just has baggage for a lot of people. Um, and there's a lot of people who are very upset that we're taking these sacred medicines and giving them the ability to be manipulated by profit incentive. So there's a whole, you know, kind of academic subculture of people who are very upset that these these medicines at all are kind of entering this latest stage of capitalism and regulated access. One way that I atone for that is by calling it a trade <laughs> instead of an industry. <laughs> so all that's happening right now. And um, by the end of the summer, uh, because people are actively growing the mushrooms and doing the manufacturing and setting up their service centers, by the end of the summer, the full licensing ecosystem will be up and running. And so that means that you know, the New York Times reporter that I've been talking to who has a friend and a family member that want to come to Oregon to receive psilocybin services for their treatment resistant anxiety, they can come to Oregon and find a, and, you know, find a facilitator beforehand to receive psilocybin services. It means that all of the, the people who didn't make it into the, the VA trials for, for psilocybin for treatment resistant PTSD can come to Oregon and receive facilities. It means elected officials, you know, who uh, God bless them, you know, instead of 
seeking a therapist, sought higher office, you know, to fill whatever <laughs> void that was left from a neglectful parent or whatever, <laughs> they can come to Oregon and receive, you know, soul seven services. Some of them might already be in Oregon, Nate. I think the majority. <laughs> I, I look forward to uh, Bet Ben's pro bono session. So uh, here you go, that goes. It's Bye, so ben. it's so possible, but like. You know, just as a side note, like, you know, people who are listening to this don't need to hear this, but it's like people have no idea how good almost every elected official is in this state, Republican, Democrat, whatever, like people are, it's so, yeah, I try not to hate on it because it's already way out of balance. But yeah, no, I mean, seriously, like, I look at someone like, you know, eventually you drop, drop a name, drop a name. No, do it. <laughs> no I shouldn't. Well, whoever it is, you know, it's like. I, I really do think we'll eventually hit a period where part of the public discourse when people are seeking to represent others and make rules that other people will live their lives by, mm -hmm. potentially for generations, I think we'll enter a point where people are seriously interested and in wanting transparency on whether or not they have developed internal resourcing and done work to understand their own motivations. Um, and a big part of that is traditional talk therapy and increasingly we'll be working with these plant and fungi medicines because there can be such a wild accelerant to uh, essentially under, understanding yourself and your own ambitions. So I joke, you know, we joke about a political party that will ask people and only endorse people who've worked with psychedelic, you know, with plant medicines. Um, but I actually think that will happen eventually and I bet it will start in Oregon. Mm -hmm. and it might start with just therapy and then eventually add on drugs. And so and Nathan, before we actually get onto the treatment, just to confirm, Oregon is the first state in the yeah. country that has done anything like this. Like there is no other state that is currently participating in a program where voters have approved. Oregon is the first of its kind when it comes to this. That's right. Yeah. Brand new, brand new model, you know, born and born and bred in Oregon. We have replicated a version of this now through a ballot measure in Colorado. That passed in Colorado, that has Steve Finberg's strong support, the center president over there uh, that I used to work with a little bit through the Bus Project Federation. He's he's really supportive and has been updating the measure through the through in the Senate, um, kind of modernize and address concerns. And Jared Polis is also a really big fan and very supportive. And so Colorado is right behind us, but we're the first. Okay. Yeah. We're the first. Gotcha. And so. So give us a little bit of insight in terms of uh, like what these type of treatments are being used for. Like I imagine that there's probably, I mean, I'm sure it varies quite a bit, but there may be some sort of typical patient profile. From my understanding, uh, this is, I, 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 you know, been used for folks who have PTSD, specifically somewhat for veterans as well, which I think is something that you had just mentioned earlier. Is there a type of person generally who seeks this type of treatment or uh, what is the kind of, you know, typical like, especially for maybe some of these folks who are just starting it out, is there, you know, again, kind of a typical profile or typical issue that folks are dealing with, or what does that kind of look like? Such a good question. Um, God, I feel like tonight with you two, my answers are especially convoluted. So I'll try to <laughs> rein that in, but it's like the, the reason certain people will seek um, psilocybin services, psychedelic therapy, psychedelic medicine, whatever term you want to use, um, FDA doesn't want us to call it medicine, of course. So it's just, it's just <laughs> if we put that on our website, as potentially well the Oregon DOJ, but it's what it is. Um, so based on essentially the public discourse around these very po powerful molecules, the people who will seek it are often people who have, uh, you know, serious um, things that they're working through in their, with their, working through and with in their life, PTSD, treatment resistant depression, treatment resistant anxiety or anxiety generally, uh, alcohol use disorder, um, general drug addiction. The reason I think people will, you know, folks in those categories who identify or have been identified as having uh, disorders or illnesses or complexes, the reason why they might seek that is because to beat back from, you know, this during the 52nd year of the war on drugs and all the conditioning, we began the FDA trial process through MAPS, which is what has informed the Oregon um, ballot measure process a bit. MAPS being the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. They essentially kept research alive after President Nixon started the war on drugs underground and then slowly worked with sympathetic populations, veterans, folks with PTSD, to get approval 
to work these trials through the FDA process. And so it, it, to me, it is all political to get us back from a half century of going after people who consume these so that we can dismantle anti-Vietnam War sentiment and tap into anti-Mexican immigration sentiment or whatever it is for Black communities. The, the way that we've done that is by targeting really gnarly issues with sympathetic populations and getting the federal government on board in university-led research. And it's also like cool too. Like we're helping people who need the most help. Like people walking around with serious PTSD and depression should have first access and should be given treatment. But it dis it distorts the narrative. It makes it think, makes people think, oh, I only have more ability to heal, you know, to be in alignment with myself, to feel life more, to feel more joy. I only, you know, I, I only have, you know, I'll only go those to those services not because I have, I think I have anything wrong with me and I have more potential to grow, only if I have PTSD, only if I have depression, you know? And so to start because of the political strategy, you will see certain groups of people self-select. But I think what will be very powerful and what we'll see happen organically in the coming years, decades and centuries is your kids are left the house and that was your part of your identity. And you're at a serious crossroads and you're like, what is my identity now? What do I wanna do? These plants, these compounds, these fungi have this powerful ability to help people tap back into just the core of their personality and what excites them and give them clarity on the next moves in their lives. So yes, it'll be people with complexes, but it'll be people who are making major life decisions. And I absolutely unequivocally believe, you know, as long as like the big earthquake doesn't like destroy the Moda Center and then the Blazers leave Portland, if the Blazers exist, you know, 10, 20, a century from now, blazers who are deciding whether to uproot their family and move to Atlanta will be consulting these medicines to help them figure out what the next chapter is for them, what the work clear is. So it'll and, run the gamut. Got, gotcha. And could you, could you walk us through, right? I think when a lot of people think, you know, and from your perspective, this is medical treatment. When a lot of people think medical treatment, right? They think go to a doctor's office, see someone in a white coat, do a surgery, get some pills, go home, follow the regiments, et cetera. What does the treatment actually look like for this? Because from my understanding too, I know there's like a, a company, I think it's a Dutch company, maybe trying to build like a camp uh, somewhere in Southern Oregon. I know that clinics are being set up. Uh, like, how does this actually work? Like, do I show up and uh, take some psychedelics and sit in a room or something like that? Do I do this at home? Like, wh what does the actual treatment look like? Hmm, that's a great question. I'm excited to facilitate your, your session when you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I, I hope my mother is not listening to this. But uh... <laughs> You know, if your mom would be happy that you decided to adopt yoga or talk therapy <laughs> or, or, not, or not drink Coke, uh, Coca-Cola, she should be very happy that you're interested in Soul Seven. She um, actually might be disappointed in all three of those things. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't actually know. Okay, well, if your mom, if your mom wants you to have unhealthy coping mechanisms in <laughs> life, then she'll be unhappy that you're considering. <laughs> so, the the answer is to start. You know, and like I think this is important to note. Like, ballot measures are super dope. You know, as you probably know, Oregon created this process. You know. Uh, because it, it can kind of sidestep a legislature that maybe is not ready for it or whatever. It doesn't feel the public pressure. They're really great because it can like leapfrog, you know, some progress can tap into where people are ready, but it's also really shit creating policy. Cause it's like, you have True. to create the opt-out provision so that like Rob Bavette and the association of Oregon counties don't have an organized opposition against you. You have to include, you know, a mandate that it's, you know, a fee finance so that you don't have like no tax groups oppose you, even though it's like, while that the, this program in the OHA right now is financed by fees, um, because the fees for a licensed facilitator is two thousand dollars. There's just no precedent, you know. So it's like MDs, NDs, no other practitioner has to pay that. And again, it goes back to that imperfect ballot measure process where we said, "Oh, it'll be self-financed by the operators." It's like that makes sense until it doesn't. So I say all this because we will have to iterate this, and I and I have like an omnibus bill in my mind for the next short session to kind of uh, evolve this a little bit or just update it. And to start what we have and what we won't have for that long, I think is a pretty confined way that people will be able to access cell seven services starting this summer. You find a facilitator online, the Oregon Health Authority lists them. 
if you figure out if uh, it's a right fit for you with that facilitator, some people are going to really want other veterans to facilitate with them because a lot of the medicine and the healing is in the actual experience and the experience is informed by who you're with. Some people are not going to want a young, you know, city Portland boy, hipster that's never left Portland like me. They're going to want like a, a woman from rural, you know, uh, Eastern Oregon. So once you find the right fit and the facilitator says, hey, I think you're a good fit, you know, like you don't seem like you have borderline personality disorder. If you did, maybe I can find a facilitator who's willing to work with you. You do or don't have complex trauma. That's I, I, I can come. I can work with that. I feel comfortable. I've done com, trauma informed, um, you know, uh, therapy before, and I'm credentialed. So once you find that person, then all psilocybin services, which is the legal name that we're calling it in the Oregon Health Authority, you can't call it psychedelic medicine because cease desist, etc. So once you get psilocybin services, or what people call psilocybin therapy. It's also a bit of a misnomer because you shouldn't be conducting therapy in the actual session. It's got to be non-directive um, mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons we can get into. Once you get, once you find a facilitator, then you're going to be at a, a Oregon licensed, licensed and regulated by the Oregon Health Authority, uh, physical location. That physical location can be at the top of the fair hair dumbbell, like the service center that we're creating at Intertrek, uh, the school uh, that I created with, with Tom, who's the creator of the ballot measure and the chief petitioner, or it can be in uh, one of the counties that haven't banned it, you know, on, on, on residential land that's zoned properly. Um, and it can be in a forest facility. You could be on a lakeside. You could be in a yurt. You could be under fluorescent lights. You can do group work, which is how people have, uh, a lot of communities, have, you know, for, for millennia have consumed psilocybin. You can be one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, you could have a horse involved. You could do art together. Uh, you could invite Moby to perform in, in front of your 16 person, you know, soul seven group. Um, you know, it really runs the gamut, but, it, but to start, it's pretty confined. There's a ratio for how many facilitators to clients that you have, depending on the dose that they opt into and that the facilitator says yes to. And then there's also uh, a huge safety plan that informs how people get there, how they're going to leave when they can leave. And it'll be kind of similar to the way that, um, the legislature landed on regulating cannabis, where they kind of think of it like it's a like a nuclear waste or an aerospace um, piece of equipment. <laughs> and in fact, it's like a complex tomato. And so as one of the first licensed cannabis companies in the state, um, my brother and I built literally a low security prison uh, around our farm, you know, same requirements that, you know, low security prisons create so that we can grow a, a tomato in. It'll be similar to start. And this is just, you know, the shadow of, of prohibition that we're on drugs to kind of um, both because potential criminals think there's going to be a bunch, a bunch of money there. Cause like, if it's illegal, it's gotta be a lot of money. And because there's still a lot of fear involved. So to start, it's going to be very regulated. Um, and it'll be at these facilities that have cameras that have a lock safe for the psilocybin and the mushroom is kept in. And there's going to be a lot of uh, internal compliance. Eventually what I would like to see very soon um, is like honor the fact that Oregon was the first, you know, to pioneer death with dignity, which essentially just like means like honoring how people want to go out of this world. Um, there's a lot of people who are, who are not going to be able to go to service centers or who can't travel for, for other reasons. So eventually we need to allow for take home. But if we included that take home provision at the start of that ballot measure, there's a good chance the polling would have been so bad that we wouldn't have been able to find money and then Ben Unger wouldn't have been our consultant and we wouldn't have raised millions of bucks, you know? So you had to start with, with what we had, but if and people would be, it's a dispensary model and people are going to be on mushrooms driving cars. But eventually now that we've got that over, I think we can kind of phase in a more kind of a nuanced approach, but to start, so, you're going to go to a center. It's going to be me and your mom, Alex. It's going to be beautiful. <laughs> listen to your favorite music. Okay. So, so a couple of questions. One you might not like, but let's start with the one that you, you'll be fine with. Okay, so let's get specific. Someone with a specific um, challenge or issue. Let's say that they're struggling with alcoholism. And they want to access this service in the hopes that it will help them beat their addiction and enter recovery. Is the idea that you go in one time, have an experience, you reframe the way that you think about it, you walk out and you this problem has been addressed in your life or is this like a recurring treatment situation? It's or... such, a, such a good question. So um, I think for most people, especially if there's real addiction, you know, like 
we know from the research at this point, like the reason people are consuming, you know, fentanyl cut with an animal tranquilizer that we call Trank, which is leading to this new, just horrendous uh, tide of psychosis and homelessness in Portland and elsewhere. You know, it's not because that drug is so damn tasty. There's underlying trauma. There's underlying issues, you know, like trauma is almost always the reason why someone develops a substance use disorder or addiction. Like the, the research is here, like almost always that's the case. So it depends on what someone is treating, what, what, someone, what someone's, you know, wanting to work through. Um, for more complex cases, more like deeply ingrained, you know, that people are coping with or using for or whatever it is, um, I think it's going to require multiple sessions for a lot of people. Um, but we're talking about maybe, you know, a fair amount of prep work with a licensed facilitator or a licensed therapist. Um, you know, I hope because Medicare and Medicaid doesn't cover this yet, there's something we, we you know, I think the proof will be in the pudding that we can show that this is like going to have huge cost savings for taxpayers and Kaiser. Eventually they will cover it the same way that we're slowly getting acupuncture and other things covered. Um, but until then, I think people can find a licensed therapist who's trauma informed for this, you know, this theoretical client. You can do preparation with someone and build an insurance. Then the SIL7 session, which maybe there are multiple over the span of a year or a couple years, maybe the rest of their life once a year. That is the part that's going to be out of pocket and eventually covered by insurance. And then integration is lifelong. You know, like, you know, one, one, one thing we tell our students is you can think of in terms of your scope of practice, your license, preparation is 25% of the work, the journey, you know, the soul seven experience where all that wild stuff happens to our meat sacks that hear our brains, that's 25% of the work. And then preparation or the integration is 50% of the work. I think for a lot of people, integration is going to be more like 90% of the work. Mm. Um, it's going to be in, in their daily interactions with their partner, the way they think about work or, or the relationship with alcohol or food or exercise or whatever it is. So at the same time, you know, there's that there's federally funded research and it has been going on for quite some time now or not, um, but they're almost always university led. The big university that does this is Johns Hopkins in the United States. And they have found that after single sessions, single cell seven sessions, um, there are these wild breakthroughs and it's important not to like overhype this. Like the worst thing we can do right now is like what happened, you know, in my opinion to like our, our cannabis company, we were breeding for non-intoxicating cannabinoids, starting with cannabidiol, which at the time nobody knew of now CBD is in everyone's vocabulary and it's become a fad. It's become a hype. It's become a bubble. You can find it in a market. Like it's led to this proliferation of profiteers and nonsense and it not actually working for people. And people give up on it as thinking about it as a medicine and thinking of it now as like, oh, mer medical cannabis was a children horse just for people to get stoned. You know, I think that's why Joe Biden on a personal level is not for cannabis. It's kind of a prohibitionist because of kind of this uh, I don't know, distortions from the profit incentive. So I digress. The Johns Hopkins research shows that like after multiple years, two months out, four months out, a year out, two years out, people continuous, consistently rate, and sometimes it grows in time, that that was one of the most transformational, important uh, experiences of my life for personal growth, for coming to terms with an abusive dad, for, for, for understanding a food eating disorder. Johns Hopkins especially focuses on end of life patients. Um, so the longitudinal study does not work for, for all the clients they see or all the patients. But as time grows on, goes on too with the prep, with the integration, integrating the insights that we got into the nature of our personalities, what makes us tick. Sometimes it grows on after one session years later and someone says, no, it is now the most important thing that's happened in my life beyond wedding, beyond my kid being born. So um, we're going to try to get to two questions. I know we're coming up on time. So question you might not like, but I'll ask it in a fair way. I love it. I love a bad question. There's no question I won't like. You can, I'm okay. so excited for it. What are the, what's the worst that could happen? What's the worst case scenario? What are the risks? Um, how could this go wrong for people who choose to opt into this? Are there safety concerns? Um, how, there's the bad question. Tons, tons of risk. Um, and the risk is already happening right now. Like people are, people are having bad 
experiences, meaning bad set and settings, they're becoming, they have psychosis and they're becoming further untethered. You know, like people with first break psychosis, schizophrenia should not, you know, like pay, our, our, our graduates in our school and most licensed facilitators, even though it's not stipulated in the law, which is kind of interesting that the Oregon Health Authority didn't require that. I actually think it's a liability issue. People will, will say, nope, you know, that can create further disorganized thinking, further mm -hmm. kind of um, disorganization. Um, and there's also people who, who will, you know, like, is it bad if someone decides to quit their job? The employer might say so. And a lot of people might say so, but it might lead an individual to be like, I just wasted the last 30 years of my life and I don't love my partner anymore. And so they're coming to realizations they already had. And a lot of people are going to say that's bad. You know, a lot of people are going to say mm -hmm. that's a bad thing. Um, is it a bad thing if someone leaves something that doesn't serve them? I don't think so. Um, but there will also be real instances of, you know, like eventually someone is going to receive these services, just like someone consumes any number of medications or drives a car and someone's going to pass away. Someone's going to do something that may, may have already happened or not. That's going to lead them to die. You know, that is going to happen. And when there's the burden, you know, when we're doing something new, women entering the workplace, self-driving cars, whatever it is, like there's this unfair higher standard that's applied, right? And so there is going to be a, there is going to be a cultural backlash of sorts when those, those negative things happen. Um, when someone makes uh, the wrong decision and, 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 and accepts someone as a client that has borderline personality disorder and it uh, makes them agitated, the facilitator, and then they become a stalker, you know, like that kind of stuff can happen. Um, and it's already happening to a degree in the underground. It's just not in the headlines like a state regulated semi taxpayer funded program will be. And rightfully so, like we, we should know of these negative outcomes. So it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when and essentially preparing people to keep context and to, to recognize that this is already happening and it's gonna be safer under a state license and regulated program. The other thing is to, to show that there's good outcomes. We just finally passed to the chamber, all the cha through the committees and both chambers. You may have seen it then. <laughs> Senate Bill 303 did a great job. Um, you know, thanks, Cinder uh, Steiner Hayward, though. Maybe no more Hayward. Understand. Love. I love Elizabeth. Um, thank you to the good senator for helping us pass this, because now we're going to have this uh, anonymized data that we're capturing from civil cyber service centers. And, and Oregon is about to, in a couple of years, do more psychedelic research about what this actually, what the outcomes are for humans than we've had in the last 50 years in the United States. So like, yeah, another really cool kind of economic cluster is going to develop in Oregon and also is going to potentially help, um, you know, accelerate humans getting back into alignment with their values, which hopefully will have an impact on the wild, you know, rates of teen depression and overdose and suicidality. And so it's also important to have that good data so that when the negative thing happens, and there's a bunch of people say, throw the baby out with the bathwater, we can say, look, super rare case, super unfortunate, and essentially an anomaly, or just very unlikely. The same way that we don't ban cars when someone gets ran over on a daily basis in Portland and killed. So uh, good segue to our last question. Hopefully you have a couple minutes, Nate, to uh, answer this one. Um, I love this. So, Ballot measure 110, which I'm not going to ask you about, um, but, yeah. but but ballot measure 110 passed with voter approval, very rocky implementation, uh, no instant solving of problems that I think voters hoped that it would. And it didn't solve there, homelessness? It didn't solve homelessness. It didn't solve addiction. And there's some polling. I know people quibble with this poll. They don't like the poll, but there's a poll that says vote. there's a majority of voters now who support recriminalizing drugs that's a separate podcast um for if you can do measure... multiple people uh I've got, I've got suggestions for that podcast and i would love to join that one too. okay we could do we can do that as a follow-up for ballot measure 109 what are the current politics of this are people calling for a repeal are people saying let's wait and see is there like a democrat republican divide on this issue like how are you seeing the politics of ballot measure 109 in oregon right now so totally different tenor uh, and environment for 109 um, because of the subject matter. You know, we, we didn't take away 
the ability for courts to mandate treatment. That's why some people, you know, <laughs> who are very good thinking people who are in charge of the attorney's offices don't like this because it kind of it essentially stops people from being able to come to terms with why they are why that why they have developed substance use disorder addiction. So it's just so different that it's not in the hot water that 110 is. Um, I honestly think <laughs> 110 is going to work well eventually and it's going to be iterated on but right now it's just like a perfect storm it's like we have really screwed up as a country at the federal level and created all these problems that have come to home roost come come to roost home locally at the same time that we are trying to create a more compassionate but more liberal approach to drug use and it just is a very serious mismatch i get why people want to repeal it um and I hope I hope that they don't, because eventually I think it's going to pay dividends. 109, you know, the main politics that you'll see about regulated access to, to entheogens or, or psychedelic medicine, psilocybin in this case, if there are politics, it largely falls on urban rural um, kind of lines. And that's because a lot of counties opted out of allowing these services. Uh, I am almost certain that the reason they opted out is because uh, I don't know if it was Rob Vett or whoever it was, Association of Oregon Counties, people absolutely organized these votes with county commissioners um, and said, hey, are you tired of people you know, in your rural areas growing high THC cannabis, selling it to New Yorkers under the guise of hemp because the plants look identical, which is a thing that I've been you know, saying is gonna eventually be a problem for like six years. Um, and they're upset. So, so it's not just like they're growing weed, it's when you do so, you're like tapping into tributaries, you're stealing other people's water rights, you are bringing in migrant labor or just labor where people aren't paid at all or in subpar work conditions. So again, prohibition is ultimately what this is, like people growing THC uh, cannabis under the guise of high, you know, low THC cannabis to make money, um, which is also commentary on just how poorly we treat farmers and, and kind of people who live in rural areas that would like to have better paying jobs. They, you know, that's not inherently bad. It's bad when you exploit human rights and the environment. And so because of that, we worked with Steve Marks and others. We created Senate Bill 301. We said, please, agencies, work together and communicate and go after people who are violating the laws that are already on the books. Some local law enforcement agencies took that as a ability to wage war on drugs 2.0 and go after people who are growing high THC cannabis and not doing anything else wrong other than not growing it in the way the government wants them to and getting them in trouble. That's not what we want to see, but what we want to see, and I don't think that's the majority of what's happening, but that it was a re- is a real problem, was a real problem, especially where all my family lives now down in Josephine County, outside of Cave Junction. And so the fears of that happening again, vast fields of people growing mushrooms, uh, was enough to create this kind of unified sentiment in most counties in Oregon where they opted out fully. Part of the reason they're doing this, and that's why I think we'd be Rob or AOC was behind this, is because they're also trying to create leverage to change the cannabis tax formula. It was broken from the start in Measure 91, and that it said the tax proceeds are going to disproportionately go back to counties that sell this plant, that sell this flower, and not back to counties that grow this flower. So the breadbasket of cannabis really for North America and certainly for Oregon, to Southern Oregon and parts of Central Oregon, see very little tax proceeds but are also trying to combat people who are stealing people's water, toxifying the watershed and soil, violating human rights. And so at some point, they're, I think they're trying to build up, up, up enough leverage to say, rejigger this somehow and, and fund, our, fund our local law enforcement, our water masters, our uh, environmental agencies, our watershed districts. Um, and so unfortunately, psilocybin services and the whole thing is kind of a, kind of a, not a scapegoat, but a, yeah, it's, I find it was well. It just got kind of it got kind of brutalized in this process. That was really not about them because I could grow all the mushrooms for this entire trade in my room. <laughs> you know, it's like you can get a lot of psilocybin from not a lot of mushrooms. I could have like layers and grow all. So it's not like all of Harney County and Josephine County and Washington County is going to be covered in illegal mushroom activity. <laughs> it's it just you know, and when and we when we've said this for years, people are like. You just want to grow the mushroom for yourself and make money. And we're like, I get conspiratorial thinking, but like, we just don't want you to lose your mom and dad's savings, you know? And, and you're like the HELOC that you just tapped into. So the other political aspect is um, we were seeing that it's going to be kind of expensive at first 
And so the people that should be the biggest champions are really frustrated because it's going to be more expensive than it should be. And philanthropy, which is something we're working on through a foundation I've created uh, with Tom and others and other methods will hopefully kind of bring down the costs. But eventually it's, we need something like a Medicaid pilot program or, or just years of results to show that Kaiser, you know, their shareholders will have to cover this because it's going to help save them money. But short term progressives, and there's a lot of groupthink progressives who are like, kill the whole thing, um, are frustrated by the access component. So most people who are really frustrated are probably on the left, if anything. So uh, you've been very generous with your time, Nate. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Um, before we let you go, if people want to learn more about psilocybin, uh, if they want to learn more about what you in particular are up to, where would you send folks? To start, I would say head to our school and service center website. Um, this is intertrek.org. This is the organization I've created with Tom Eckert. It's the the architect and chief petitioner of Measure 109. Um, and you know, we also work together to try to replicate this around the country. Um, then if people are interested in like the accessibility component um, and how to like help people participate who don't have a lot of money, whether that's starting a school or a service center or becoming a facilitator or receiving services, head to our foundation, uh, 501c3 we've created, Sheree Eckert. We, made, we um, created this in honor of Sheree Tom's uh, late wife and my friend who passed away unexpectedly soon after we passed Measure 109. Um, and then outside of that, maybe I'll write another piece on Oregon 360. Uh, Do it. I wrote something that uh, Kevin and others, uh, I think, uh, thought made sense given that I'm a guy that's interested in psychedelics that was way too long, um, like a year or two or so ago. January fifth. I, I do okay. I do remember that now. That was probably the longest. <laughs> that was probably the longest piece you've ever published. So yeah, we'll, we'll have to have another one. We will. So, we will the, I'll make them a shorter. I'll do like a series next time, like Kevin encouraged me to do. We're gonna do a hard cap at five hundred words for your next piece. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are we are over time. Nathan Howard, pleasure to talk to you again. Thank you for coming on the podcast, and uh, listeners, we'll see you back here next week. Thank you guys. Thank you for creating this show. It's so valuable, this podcast and the work you all do. Very big fan. Thanks, man.